Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Misquoting Jesus. Today, we're talking about where is Jesus in Genesis? If you listen to some evangelical preachers, you get the very definite impression that Jesus is just walking all over the pages of the Old Testament. But is he actually present at all? Is this belief that Jesus is in the Old Testament original to modern Christianity? And how do academics deal with evidence provided by believers? Before that, Bart, good morning. How are you doing today? Good morning. Yep, doing doing pretty well. It's nice nice being on uh, sabbatical leave for the semester, yeah. so I can actually, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Are you able to do any traveling while you're while you're on leave, or are you just solidly writing? Um, most of the time, I'm writing. I'm going to be doing some trips. Um, I'm going. Yeah, I've got a lot of travel uh, lined up for the summer, and so I'm hoping that I'll be done with the book by then. <laughs> but one one of the um, one of the trips I'm doing is. Um, Pretty, uh, I think it's pretty interesting. I'm going to be doing this cruise to the uh, uh, that's sponsored by a group called Thalassa uh, Journeys, which is a it tends to have educational trips, and so they have an expert giving lectures on things. And um, we're going to do uh, we're doing this cruise down the down the west coast of Europe, going to western cities of Europe. And um, so, uh, and last summer I, I happened to go to Bruges, and we're going to Bruges. <laughs> so we're going to start in Amsterdam, then go to Bruges, and we go all the way down and end up in Lisbon, but on this like e- ecologically really cool boat. And so, um, yeah, so uh, I really, you know, when I do travel, I really like traveling in. Uh, Lots of places. Obviously, I go to lots of places. But Western Europe is is one of the places I really like a lot. And if people, I should say, if people are interested in that thing, um, I don't think you knew I was going to talk about the cruise area <laughs> when when you raised that question. But now that you mentioned it, if they're interested, just look up Follow Us Journeys and give them a call and see if they can join up. So, how about you? Are you uh, you got travel plans? Um, so I have a couple. Uh, Josh and I will be going down to Austin. We've been invited to do a presentational workshop on. Uh, digital media for the Middle Eastern Studies Department at uh, University of Texas at Austin. So I haven't actually been to Texas before. Oh, well, yeah. when you go to Austin, it's not exactly like Texas. <laughs> I have also heard that. Uh, and we'll only be there for a couple of days, but uh, that's exciting. And then my parents' silver wedding anniversary is coming up in uh, June or July. I never remember which. Okay. So I'll be going home for a week or two to Just celebrate that with them. Yeah. Yeah, That'd great. Be fun. Well, you know, Austin. Austin is a great city. Their restaurant scene is fantastic. Music, obviously, is unbelievable. It's, it's a, it's a great. There are a lot of great places in Texas, but Austin is is one of them. Yeah. I have a couple of friends who live around Austin, so I'm going to be asking uh, them for recommendations of things we can do quickly good. while we're there. Yeah. Right. Good. <laughs> okay, Jesus in Genesis, which is not honestly a topic I've thought an awful lot about before now, why do some modern Christians want to read Jesus into the books of the Old Testament? Uh, Yeah, well, they certainly do that. And, uh, you know, so much so that uh, just as kind of a little anecdote, when I was um, when I first became a born again Christian in high school, uh, the Bible, I couldn't really understand the King James Version. And so I I got a paraphrase Bible. Uh, They used to call it the living Bible, but they, they have other ones like that today. Like they call it the way and stuff. And uh, I didn't realize the problem with places where they actually use Jesus' name in the Old Testament. <laughs> and Jesus said, so what? And, and well, I didn't know. And so that's, yeah, so it's, it's pretty common. And it's, uh, you know, it's because uh, in the Christian tradition, as it developed from the earliest of Christian times, the idea was that the Hebrew Bible, the, the Jewish scriptures, were anticipating Jesus. And they were uh, predicting Jesus, and they were looking forward to Jesus. And even in the New Testament, we're told that the prophets of old were anticipating Jesus. And so the idea is that Jesus is there already, and um, in the first book, uh, and far back in Christianity, in the early centuries of Christianity, people started finding Jesus uh, throughout the Old Testament, including Genesis, <laughs> which you wouldn't expect, but there it is. And, and they had some very interesting interpretations of things that would show that, yep, Jesus is there already. 
Well, I said in, in the the question in the opening, modern Christianity, but you've just said it, it happens back in Christianity's earliest days. And we see that in the Gospels, don't we? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, the Gospels are pretty, uh, I mean, the Gospels are pretty clear that the Old Testament was expecting uh, expecting Jesus and predicting Jesus and prophesying Jesus. And that, um, uh, and so they, they don't, it's not quite the same as saying that, um, you know, they don't ever say that Jesus was in Genesis, you know, but they, they use a lot of biblical passages to show that these passages were, were at least thinking about Jesus. Um, and I think part of the deal is, is that the early Christians, uh, the earliest Christians believed that Jesus had been made a divine being when he got raised from the dead. That uh, the early, the very earliest Christians thought Jesus was a human that God had made divine to reward him for what he had done for dying for the sake of others. And so they didn't think that he pre-existed. Uh, once you start getting to the idea that he pre-existed, which you get, you get some indication of in Paul, and then certainly uh, in the Gospel of John, then if he pre-existed, um, you know, in what sense is he connected with, you know, the promises of God in the Hebrew Bible, and in what sense is he connected with the Hebrew Bible, and uh, and so that develops eventually develops into the doctrine of the Trinity. And some some people start saying, well, yeah, well, it wasn't just God who's showing up in the Old Testament, but Jesus himself as well. So outside of the Gospels, do other books of the New Testament identify Jesus in the Old Testament? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, some do it more explicitly than the Gospels. The Gospels talk a lot about Jesus fulfilling prophecy um, that was made looking forward to him. Uh, but already by Paul, writing before the Gospels, um, Paul thinks about Jesus as actually being in the Old Testament. I mean, there's this really interesting and peculiar passage that I think um, most people maybe haven't really paid attention to or like can't make sense of. It's it's a complicated passage in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. Paul is saying that the children of Israel um, were uh, baptized uh, and were uh, were followers of Jesus, even though they may not have known about it. They they get uh, you know they're they're wandering around in the wilderness, and uh, in this passage that he's referring to, it's Exodus chapter uh, seventeen. The children of Israel have gone through the Dead Sea and they've they're marching in the wilderness, going to Mount Zion to to where they're going to get the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law, and and. There's no water, <laughs> so part of these part of the ep these episodes in Exodus are about there's no food, there's no water. You know why did you bring us out here? <laughs> we were doing fine in Egypt, and and they're complaining because there's no water. And Moses saying, "Look, what are you complaining to me for?" You know, and, and then God says, "Okay, look, strike this rock, and water will come out, and they'll be able to drink." So Moses goes up to the rock and he strikes it, and water comes out, and they drink. Paul talks about them drinking water from the rock. And then Paul says, this is 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 4. Paul says, and the rock was Christ. Whoa. Christ is the one who saves people by providing them with what they need so that they don't perish. So Christ is the rock, <laughs> the one who provides the water. So, uh, yeah. So he's there already in Paul. That's really interesting. Do we see this in other non New Testament writings, the Apocrypha. Oh yeah, it becomes a major theme uh, for many of the writers. Um, there's this, there's this writing. I mentioned it in our previous episode a couple of weeks ago. There's a, there's a book called the Epistle of Barnabas. Um, it's a letter that is anonymous, but um, in the early church, they, they, they said that it was written by this person Barnabas, who in the New Testament is one of Paul's companions. And the, this letter of Barnabas is very interesting, and some people thought it belonged in the New Testament. It's in some New Testaments from the, the ancient world. It's a letter that tries to show that Jews uh, misunderstand their own religion and that their Bible, the Jewish Bible, is actually not a Jewish Bible. It's a Christian Bible and that it's thoroughly Christian in every way, and that it's really about Christ. It's not about whatever they think the Mosaic law is supposed to be. And so he has he has example after example after example, and some of them are really kind of interesting. My, one of my favorite ones is he's trying to show that Jesus is already present in the mind of a God and Abraham, the father of the Jews, uh, and that the, the rite of circumcision 
that uh, Jewish boys have to be circumcised on the eighth day. That's the agreement that God makes with Abraham, that he'll be the God of the Jewish people, but the Jewish boys have to be circumcised. And Barnabas wants to know, what's that really mean? And Barnabas, this author, uh, whoever he really was, doesn't think that the law of Moses really was meant to be taken literally. God doesn't really mean you can't eat pork. You know, it doesn't mean you really can't do anything on the Sabbath. I mean, he's, these are all symbolic things. And circumcision also is symbolic, he says. And he comes up with this great explanation. He says that Abraham, the father of the Jews, the father of circumcision, at one point in Genesis, uh, went off to rescue his uh, nephew Lot who had been taken captive by some foreign kings. And Abraham rouses an army of his own slaves, and he has them circumcised before they go in to, uh, to, rescue, them, to uh, rescue Lot. And he circumcised 318 of them. Okay. Barnabas says, why 318? Well, in ancient languages, uh, the way you do numbers is you take letters of the alphabet. And so each letter of the alphabet has a numerical equivalent. So in Greek, alpha, the first letter is one, beta is two, gamma is three. And when you get to 10, iota, then the next letter, kappa is 20, then 20, 30, 40, up to, and, and so on. You go, th when you get to 90, the next one's 100, then 200, 300, et cetera. The letter, so 318, you do it with letters. And the letters would be um, a tau, uh, like a T, an iota, like an I, and an eta, which is like a long E. They have numerical values. The, Iota and the eta add up to 18, and the tau is 300. So the way you make a 300 is with a uh, iota, eta, and a tau. And he points out that iota, eta, those first two letters are the first two letters of the name Jesus. And the tau looks like a T. It's in the shape of a cross. Salvation comes by the cross of Jesus. And it's already in the book of Genesis. It's in the Old I, Testament. <laughs> I don't want to throw a massive spanner in the works here, but it is my understanding that Genesis was not originally written in Greek. <laughs> I know. It's a problem. <laughs> but Barnabas, <laughs> I don't know, his readers like aren't even paying attention to that. They're saying, oh, my God, the cross of Jesus, it's right there. <laughs> he solved the problem. Circumcision is not a thing. And yeah, and it's not, yeah, you don't have to be cutting into your baby boy's penises. You need to be following the cross of Jesus. That's what Abraham teaches us. And so, yeah, it's linguistically, it's problematic, but you know, a lot of interpretations are linguistically problematic. <laughs> this is true. Once, once the Trinity becomes a, a doctrine or a theological concept, do we see early Christians also reading the Trinity back into the Old Testament? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you get it right off the bat. I mean, you go to Genesis, right? So um, in Genesis, when um, uh, God creates the heavens and the earth in chapter one, and he, um, you know, and he creates it in a sequence, you know, first let there be light. And, you know, then there's the first day and then there's the second day and you have things created on different days. On the sixth day, uh, God creates humans. But in this case, instead of God just saying something, God says, let us make the human in our own image. He uses the word us. Well, why is it us? He's talking to somebody. And in other passages of the Old Testament, uh, it talks about how God created um, the world by speaking his word. The word of God is what created the, the world. And so like uh, Psalm 33 or something says this. And then when you get to the New Testament, John chapter one says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God and all things came into being by him. Okay, the word of God. But in Je John, John 1 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, and then it identifies us as Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the word that God speaks in Genesis 1, and that's why he says, let us create humans in our own image. But it's not only Jesus, because right at the beginning of Genesis, before even before he creates light, we're told that the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. So you got the Spirit of God hovering over the water. Then you got God the Father talking to God the Son. You got the Trinity, and it's in Genesis chapter one. And so this was, uh, you know, this is one of the ways you read these things. 
Fantastic. We're going to get into that a little bit more, but we're going to take a very brief ad break. Please stick with us because we're going to go back into this example of the Trinity in Genesis. And I've also scoured the internet and found a couple of other examples of Jesus in Genesis that I would like to get Bart's take on. Uh, So please come back for that. Most people know many of the stories of Genesis. The creation. Adam and Eve. Noah and the flood. The stories about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. But do you know what scholars say about those accounts? What archaeology, science and history can reveal about them? What their significance could be, even if they aren't literally true? Enter Bible scholar Bart Ehrman's captivating online course, In the Beginning, History, Legend and Myth in Genesis. In six enlightening lessons, you'll journey through questions like, did Genesis borrow its stories from other cultures? Are these accounts historical or legendary? And who were the real authors behind the Pentateuch? Whether you approach Genesis as a believer, a skeptic, or simply a seeker of knowledge, this course will challenge your understanding of these ancient narratives. It's a unique opportunity to navigate the complexities of the Bible's most famous book. Don't miss out on this intellectual adventure. Visit barterman.com forward slash Genesis to learn more or sign up today. And be sure to use discount code MJPODCAST for a special discount. So before the break, I asked you about the Trinity in Genesis. Well, I asked about the Trinity in the Old Testament specifically, and you said, wait, right there from the very beginning, we have God, we have the Word, and we have the Spirit. Is this a little, it seems a little convoluted um, to the uninitiated. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think theology of any kind of theology is convoluted to the outsider, Um, not just Christian theology, but, um, you know, uh, just in any religion, the, the the intricacies of the theology make sense mainly to those who are buying into it. Um, and so if you buy into the premises, then it makes perfect sense. Um, and in fact, it not only makes perfect sense, it's like anything else would be nonsense. Um, and so if, if you come up with an alternative explanation for why God says, let us make the human in our own image, people say, well, that isn't what it says. It's us. It's got to be plural. It's got to be talk- Jesus talk- God talking to somebody. And the only one else he could be talking to is another, another divine being. And so it's Jesus. You know, so, so like, it just makes sense to them. And if you say something like, well, yeah, but, you know, in, in the Old Testament, you know, the, the first person plural gets used for like a singular, just like when the queen says, or the king now says, we are not amused, <laughs> he's not, he means me. <laughs> and so you can say those things, but it doesn't make sense because of course it's the Trinity. It does sound convoluted, I know. That actually is is leading very nicely into the next example that I found everywhere, which is this use of the first person plural. And it happens a lot. God says, let us make man our image. And in Hebrew, the word often used to refer to Yahweh is Elohim, which is a plural noun, which, like you've said, people take and say, well, this means that clearly God is part of a a plurality and that this is the Trinity in the Old Testament. So therefore, Jesus is, is here. How do biblical scholars usually understand all of this plural language? Yeah. Well, Elohim is an interesting uh, case. Uh, it is a plural. Uh, it's a plural noun. When you add I am in English, im, to the end of a Hebrew word, it, it makes it plural, a masculine plural. Um, and so Elohim is plural of the word El, E-L, which is, uh, which is also a name for the divinity. El was actually a divinity in the Canaanite pantheon. Uh, and so they're 
taking the word for God from the from a name of a God in the Canaanite uh, and the Canaanite religion religions. Um, the name Elohim, the word Elohim is actually not a name. It's a description, just like word God is not a name. Um, you know, if God had a name in the Old Testament, it's Yahweh. That's his name. But you call him God. That's Elohim. So why is it plural? Um, it's usually thought that it's some kind of plural of majesty, uh, meaning that, um, well, like, you know, we are not amused. It's kind of a royal we, and Elohim is used in the plural. It's important to point out, though, that the conception was very much singular uh, throughout the Hebrew Bible. When they use the word Elohim and then they use a verb with it, they use the singular form of the verb. They you don't, don't use the uh, plural form of the verb. So uh, the subject is singular, even though the word itself is plural. And you also get things like Elohim saying, I alone am God and there is no other. <laughs> I. <laughs> and so uh, it's not we alone are gods. It's I alone am God. So they, they're using the word plural probably to elevate the status of this, this of majesty for Elohim. But, that, but the conception is there's only one of, one of them. Thank you. Also, in, in Genesis, another argument that I found was that when Adam and Eve hid from hid in shame from God when they heard him walking in the garden, they were actually hiding from Jesus. I didn't understand this particular example, and I was wondering <laughs> if you had come across it before, and if you had, could you explain it to me? I not only came across it, I used to believe it. <laughs> when I was a fundamentalist, man, we saw this stuff all over the place. Um, so there's a logic to it. And again, if you're inside the system, the logic makes perfect sense. Uh, in the doctrine of the Trinity, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is uh, the Almighty, uh, who is thought of as being uh, the transcendent one. The Spirit is the one who's here with us now, guiding our lives and our actions and, and being involved with us on a kind of a daily basis. The Son is the one who becomes uh, incarnate to bring about salvation. So if you talk about which member of the Trinity is portrayed as a human who is incarnate, who takes on human characteristics, it's the Son, uh, not the Father. And so if you have God in the Old Testament appearing incarnate as a human being or in human likeness, then it has to be the Son, because the Son is the incarnate one of the Trinity. Uh, and so you play that out throughout the Old Testament, um, where, uh, where wherever God shows up, like in, when, um, when Moses is at the burning bush, uh, the Lord speaks to him from the burning bush. That's that's actually Jesus, and you get that 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 interpretation goes all the way back uh, to uh, already in the writings of Justin, this mid second century, around 150, church father living in Rome, a philosopher. He he talked about the incarnate Christ in the Old Testament, and so that that's that's an old one. Is there anything else about the garden scene that kind of points some people towards viewing this as Jesus rather than Yahweh? Yeah, well, there's another aspect of this that I think is even more interesting in some ways um, that they, again gets used in early Christianity a bit. So, you know, when Adam and Eve eat the fruit, which is not called an apple, <laughs> they eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and God finds out that they did it. Uh, he doesn't know at first. He's walking through the garden in the cool of the day, cool of the evening, we're told. <laughs> Adam, where are you? You know, and Adam's hiding because they they know they've messed up because they've been enlightened about, you know, good and evil. And they know they're naked. And so Adam says, well, you know, you know we're sorry. <laughs> and then that's how God finds out. So it's a very anthropomorphic understanding of God in this passage. But Adam and Adam, uh, is, they're embarrassed by their nakedness, and so Adam makes, makes kind of a coverings for their genitals out of fig leaves. Um, and then God, when God realizes what's happened, he, he curses them, but then he makes them better coverings. He makes, uh, gives them animal skin. He makes uh, coverings out of animal skins uh, to, cover, to cover themselves up. Um, and early Christian exegetes found this really interesting because the way their sin was covered was apparently by the sacrifice of an animal. How else do you get animal skins? And the sacrifice of animals in the Old Testament is prefiguring the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. 
So it's Jesus himself whose death covers the sin of Adam and Eve. See that? Because of the... That's interesting. Yeah. I see that. I have another question. If Jesus is always present when there are when God is doing bodily human things, when he's walking and talking. And why does Yahweh say, let us make man in our image if he doesn't personally have a body? Would it not be, let us make him in your image? Oh, that's a good, yeah, that'd be a good counter argument. And uh, that's right. Let's make him in your image. <laughs> uh, I think the idea is that um, Jesus hasn't become fully incarnate yet. Um, and so that's that's why he's not he's not a human yet. He's not a human until he becomes incarnate. He's the one who can, who's capable of incarnation. So he is the one who has the um, like the capacity of incarnation. And so they're made in that the image of that capacity. I guess is how they answer it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it, it, I was just just bothering no, me slightly. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> I know. So one, one of the other um, examples I found was Genesis 3.15, which reads, uh, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I found multiple places, multiple websites saying that this is evidence of Jesus. And again, I didn't understand it. And would you please explain it to me <laughs> like I'm five? <laughs> I will indeed. So, um, right. Um, so the serpent in Genesis 3 is an actual serpent. It's not, you know, it's not an evil force. It's not the devil or Satan. Or, it's a serpent who is the, you know, why the craftiest of all creatures, depending on how you translate it. And so um, the serpent uh, is t can talk and it convinces Eve to eat the fruit and then she convinces Adam. And so ultimately the serpent is uh, the problem and God punishes uh, Adam for listening to his wife. Now he's got to work for to earn his bread. He can't just pick fruit trees. And Eve is punished for what she's done. Now she's going to experience labor pains when she gives birth. Apparently the original plan was for her not to have labor pains somehow. <laughs> um, and then, but then the serpent is punished, and God makes it crawl on its belly uh, and eat dirt. And so, this is explaining why snakes don't have legs. Uh, and it presupposes the snakes originally did have legs. <laughs> so it's kind of, uh, and so, um, in in the book, that that's it. That's the serpent. Um, what ends up happening in the Christian tradition is that the serpent in the garden comes to be interpreted as the devil who is tempting Adam and Eve. And um, you get this in the final book of the New Testament, final book of the Bible. So you get the serpent in the beginning in Genesis, and you get this identification in the final book, Revelation, where um, the devil is identified as the serpent of old. Um, the, the devil, Satan, and the serpent of old are the same figure. That means that the devil is the one who's in the garden. So the snake is actually and kind of an incarnation of the devil. So he will bite your heel and you will, uh, you will squat, you will crush his head. This is referring to uh, what happened to Jesus crucifixion. The devil will uh, bring about pain for Jesus and suffering, but Christ will destroy the devil. He will kill the devil with his crucifixion. And so um, this is, this is foreshadowing the uh, crucifixion of Jesus, uh, who will conquer then, uh, conquer the devil, which, by the way, is portrayed in a graphic way in a movie that a lot of my students like that I do not, um, uh, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, uh, which begins with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and there's a snake there, and nothing is said about it, but the snake's crawling, and Jesus just all you see is his foot coming down and stamping it, <laughs> killing it, <laughs> stomping on it. And first time I saw this movie in a theater, people started applauding and cheering because <laughs> it's got it's Jesus, you know, defeating Satan the way that he's said to do in Genesis <laughs> for them. Interesting. Thank you. Are there other apparent references to Jesus in the book of Genesis that people have pointed out to you? Well, there are a lot of them. I mean, um, you can find Jesus in a lot of places. And uh, the flood story with Noah, 
was often taken to be a, a foreshadowing of uh, salvation to be brought by Jesus, where uh, the world's going to be destroyed and only a few people will be saved. And Jesus, and so the flood came to repre- came to be a common, or the, the, the ark, actually the ark of Noah has come to see as the church that uh, Jesus uh, brought people into to save them from the coming destruction. Um, one of the key very long passages is the the narrative about Joseph, which takes up a huge chunk of the, it takes up the, the end of Genesis, chapter after chapter about Joseph. Joseph is uh, one of the 12 uh, uh, sons of Israel, and his brothers get jealous of him, and they sell him uh, for silver into slavery, and he goes down into Egypt, and he then is exalted, and he brings salvation because the uh, his brothers don't know this has happened. They think he's just dead or something. And but he goes down to Egypt, and he becomes the right hand man of Pharaoh. And when they get in trouble for from a famine, they go down to Egypt, and he saves them. And early in Christianity, Joseph was thought to be a type of Christ. In other words, that he's a foreshadowing of Christ as the one who is betrayed by his own people, by his own brothers for silver and is um, is uh, then exalted by God to be his right hand man and then brings salvation to those who rejected him. And so Joseph was thought to be a kind of a, a, a type and kind of a typological interpretation of Jesus. And so there he is again in Genesis. And so you get him all the way from the creation to the Garden of Eden to uh, Noah and in other places too, but then ending up in Joseph. So it seems like this has been clearly going on since the start of Christianity as a religion. Do you think it's possible for Christians to interpret the Old Testament and Genesis in particular without viewing it through this lens of this is all Jesus? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, um, there are there are a lot of Christians who are historical scholars or, or who are uh, a lot of historical scholars are Christians. And and a lot of a lot of Christians read the Bible historically and they realize that Genesis was written, you know, was <laughs> centuries before Jesus. And so they don't think Jesus is in there. They, they might think that Jesus, you know, maybe there's some kind of relevance, but it's not that Jesus is actually uh, in there. And one of, one of the big issues, I think, for Bible readers maybe the most complicated one is this one about historically reading uh, the Bible, because people are people who read the Bible tend to be believers, and they're taught that it's all one book. And if it's all one book, it's all unified. And if it's all written by God, there's no incoherence. And one part of it can interpret another part of it. Uh, and so um, it's, that, that's, that's an old view of Christianity, that one part of Scripture needs to interpret another part. And so we get that, but we get it uh, especially pronounced in the during the Reformation. And so Protestants in particular uh, have stressed this, that that uh, they're all, it's all interrelated. But that means that if you're going to read uh, the Gospels, on one hand, of course, I mean, you know, you've got to know what the Old Testament is saying to make sense of what the New, New Testament says about the Old Testament. And so scholars, whether they're involved with religious studies or biblical studies or, or just literary studies generally, talk about a phenomenon called intertextuality. Intertextuality is the idea that meaning moves between texts, intertexts. And one way it works is kind of obvious. I mean, if, if the Gospel of Matthew quotes a passage from, say, Exodus, um, then uh, then you can understand Matthew better if you know what Exodus is talking about. So then you know what he's referring to. But intertextuality doesn't just affect when somebody quotes or alludes to an other passage. If you believe in full intertextuality, then that other passage can be interpreted in light of the one that interprets it. Because it's all intertextual. They both interpret each other. So you get this, for example, um, well, just, I mean, just pick an example, not in the, in Genesis, but when, when, um, uh, when the book of Matthew says, out of Egypt, have I called my son? Um, that's a quotation from Hosea, who's referring to the Exodus. But when people read the book of, uh, and so, and so to understand what Matthew's saying, you've got to know what Hosea is talking about. But then when a Christian who knows about all that reads Hosea, 
he thinks that it's about Jesus, or she thinks it's about Jesus because of the intertextuality. And sometimes it's really hard for Christians not to do that, even if they want to. If, if somebody doesn't believe me in this, read anyone, read Isaiah 53 and try not to think about Jesus. <laughs> Good luck. We dare you. <laughs> Isaiah 53 is not talking about Jesus, but Christians cannot read it. Most people can't read it without thinking it's talking about Jesus because they're used to seeing how the suffering servant is applied in the case of Jesus in the New Testament. So they think that Isaiah must be talking about the suffering Messiah Jesus in Isaiah, <laughs> which he isn't. So if Genesis and obviously the rest of the Old Testament just don't talk about Jesus because they don't, they were written a long time before Jesus existed as a person. In what sense should they be seen as Christian books or Christian scriptures? Well, you know, it's one thing to read it as a historical document, which, you know, historians do, scholars do, and many Christians do, where you read Genesis just to try to understand Genesis in its own context. You know, we historical scholars insist that's a very good way to read the book of Genesis. It's how we should read most books, but there are other ways to read it, right? You can read Genesis for all sorts of reasons, just to speak, stick with Genesis, for example. You could read Genesis as a science textbook. I don't recommend it, but people do. The six-day creation, six 24-hour days, that's how God created the world. The world is X number of years old. It's, you know, created by God in six days. You could read it that way. Um, you could read it um, as a uh, kind of a metaphor for how we ought to live our lives. It's giving us instruction. You know, be obedient uh, to God uh, and be good to one another. And, you know, you can come up with, with like, lessons. So you're reading it for that kind of, for, kind of for moral instruction, whether or not it's historically correct. You could read it as a literary work, trying to understand what its themes are, what its motifs are, what, how its character development works. You can read it as a piece of literature. So you can read it in all these different ways. If you're a Christian, you can read it as a Christian book. Um, you can read it as a Christian book without saying, yes, the author meant for, to be talking about Jesus here. <laughs> you can read it in a, as a Christian book, for example, by saying, look, I'm, I'm a Christian. And in my view, this is scripture, and it's authoritative for me in some way. Um, I don't think it, you could say, I don't think it's literally true, but it's, it's in some way trying to convey uh, an understanding of God that I think I can subscribe to. Um, and so you can read it that way, and there's no reason not to read it that way if you're a Christian. You can read it in a Jewish way. You can read it in a humanist way. It's, so you can certainly do that. And if you understand if you're a Christian and you understand that the Bible is a canon of authoritative writings, then you probably do want to read it that way. Um, that doesn't preclude the option of reading it historically, though, to understanding it in its own context, as well as understanding it, how it might relate to your Christian faith. Have there been any debates about this? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, boy, have there been. <laughs> Still are. So, but yeah, okay. So when I was doing my PhD exams at Princeton Theological Seminary, I had a, um, I had exams, like, you have to take PhD exams before you write your dissertation. You take courses for a couple of years, seminars, and you take your exams and you take your, do your dissertation. And the exams are in a range of things. So I had, like, an exam on the history of early Christianity. And I had an exam on, you know, interpreting the New Testament, the theology of the New Testament. But I had an exam on the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible. And I had some question or other about the relationship of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I insisted in my answer that you can understand the Old Testament perfectly well without a New Testament. You don't need the New Testament to interpret the Old. And a couple of the faculty members who were kind of more theologically oriented than I was at that stage got really upset. <laughs> you, look, it's in the canon and it's all part of it. And, and then the other faculty members started like getting upset with them. And so this was a great defense for my, like, this is my oral defense when they're, they're questioning me. It was great because I got the two sides arguing with each other and I just sat back smiling. <laughs> I didn't have to say anything because they were going at it. And like, oh, man, just nod like, and look wise. <laughs> it's like, is this going to end soon? Because like, in my exam will be over and they'll be arguing. That's great. That's <laughs> like, yeah, people do argue about this, especially theologians. Of course, I mean, you know, non-theologians don't argue about it. <laughs> you don't you don't read Jesus in Genesis. Of course not. Um, and many, his, many theologians, of course, agree with that. 
but they still say that, of course, you can understand it for uh, for understanding me Christian meaning in your Christian life without assuming that the author is trying to you know, write about Jesus here. Thank you very much. We're going to take a very quick break and we will be right back. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings, and online course launches. And we are back. Now, Bart, we have just had Jodie Magnus's uh, recording of her course, uh, Archaeology in the Time of Jesus. That was the live recording was this weekend. For those who missed it, you can still watch the recordings. They'll be available uh, in in perpetuity. How did the event go? How was it? Well, I told everybody it was going to be great, and I challenge anybody to say it wasn't. <laughs> jo Jody's a piece of dynamite. She is like she is very vibrant, and um, and um, she. Um, you know, people saw that when they, they we did this Bible conference, you know, last year, we're going to do another one this year, but we did one last year where Jody was one of the speakers and man, is she enthusiastic and people just loved it then. And this thing was four of her lectures on, you know, things directly related to the stuff I do, but I'm not an archaeologist and she is. Um, and and she covered such such a range of interesting things from, you know, what life would have been like for Jesus growing up and what it was like to live up there in Galilee and to, you know, what what did he find when he came to Jerusalem? And what about those Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, you know, and then, you know, and and like this death and burial, there are a lot of controversies about that. And she and I actually have disagreements about the death and burial of Jesus, but not not the archaeology of it. <laughs> and she knows this archaeology really well. And, and for all of these things, the thing is that people, what people need to realize is that, you know, the life of Jesus happened in a time and place. If you don't know that time and place, you're not going to understand it. You're not going to understand his life. I mean, you can't talk about uh, George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or Abraham Lincoln, if you don't know their time and place. And so you just got to, and archaeology is one of the best ways to figure out their time and place. And so she, she went through all that and, uh, and it's great. And people, people can still buy this course and, uh, and uh, you know, get, get all the stuff. And, uh, they, you know, if you're interested in, in the historical Jesus or ancient Israel, or this, this is a good course to do it from. And she, you're right, she is an incredibly engaging speaker. And I have to say that watching someone who is so enthusiastically passionate about what they do is always a huge pleasure. And it makes the material so much more engaging as well. It's wonderful. It's amazing what you can make boring if you want to. <laughs> and, if you try and, really hard. Well, I tell you, a lot of university professors have mastered that art. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, but there are a lot who are really, really good. And man, I tell you, you can make, and you know, yeah, no, yeah. So archaeology, you can make that pretty boring. I had just a bunch of old rocks, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm telling you, this is really interesting. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, if that sounds interesting to you, then like, uh, like Bart said, that's four lectures. Um, you can uh, buy access to the recordings through the uh, website, which is bartherman.com forward slash time of Jesus. The cost is thirty nine dollars and ninety five cents. And as always, you can use the code MJ podcast for a discount on that price. Are we going to go over to some listeners' questions now? Now it's time for questions from listeners, where Bart answers real questions submitted by misquoting Jesus fans. If you'd like to submit a question for future segments, please visit bartermancom slash ask Bart. All right, Matthew's infancy narrative with its Magi and star seems to have been invented out of whole cloth. Today, many believers think it is literally true. Do you think Matthew's original audience also thought it was true or would it have been understood as symbolism? Oh, we don't really know. We don't have any kind of, uh, you know, readers reports <laughs> or, uh, or any indication. When we do start finding people talking about it, uh, church fathers who refer to it, they appear to think it really happened. Um, and I think that um, I would say that most people today still think it really happened. And so it isn't just that like we moderns know that kind of thing could not have happened. Most moderns, two billion Christians in the world, most of them who know, Jen, know Matthew would say, yeah, yeah, that happened. So it's there are really good reasons for thinking it did not happen that I've talked about um, in other 
settings, including in in my recent course on Matthew. Um, but uh, yeah, but I think I, I suppose they probably thought it happened, but we don't really know for sure. Next question. You've mentioned that the literal or fundamentalist interpretation of the Bible emerged out of the 19th century and scientific developments that threatened people's faith. What was the interpretation before this if it wasn't a literal one? Oh, no, that's a, that's a good question. And um, I didn't mean that the literal interpretation was invented in the 19th century. Literal interpretations go, uh, go all the way back. Um, our, first, um, our first Christian authors who talk about how to interpret texts have a variety of ways they interpret the, the Bible, the New Testament. So, for example, the Church Father Origen in the third century has um, various ways. One of the ways that he calls it is katarema, which is, uh, there are two words in Greek, uh, which means according to the word. By that, he means what we would pretty much mean literally word for word. But he, he, he realized that um, sometimes if you interpret a text literally, it contradicts another text or it makes no sense. <laughs> and so he, so he's very good at finding these contradictions and things. And he said, when that happens, it means you can't interpret it literally. You have to interpret it figuratively or spiritually. It's not meant literally. So that goes way back. And then he developed that. And then over the centuries, this became the big deal. Uh, and by a few centuries later, there were four ways of interpreting a text. And the literal was considered to be the weakest of the four. Um, you know, yeah, you got to interpret literally, but it's not really where the action is. The real action is what's going on underneath the literal reading. And that continued all the way up to the Reformation. Um, so there always was a literal reading. When the Reformation hit, Martin Luther insisted that it's only the literal reading that matters. And so he developed a, a, a stress on uh, the literal meaning. But even, even then, um, through through the Reformation and onward, most interpreters recognized that there were other senses in which you could interpret the text. And even interpreting it literally didn't mean um, like insisting necessarily that every single word has to be directly from God. That, that idea is a later development, and it had to develop because um, you had people saying that when God creates the world in six days, they believe that, that is literally true, but they'd say, but a day, you know, it could be a, a like a geological period. And so God created the world over six geological periods, and that would open up the possibilities then uh, for evolution. And people said, no, 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 it's, it says day. It means day. Day, it's 24 hours, it's a day. And th so th it's that kind of literalism where it has to be strictly exactly what the word says is is something when uh, it started appearing mainly when people were doubling down on scripture. Thank you. Uh, some experts theorize that the quality or lack thereof of the Greek in the New Testament had an impact on the social status of early pagan converts. The idea is that as educated Romans were taught to regard poor language as an indicator of poor intelligence, Christianity ended up being a religion for the uneducated, like women of, and slaves, which I know we've, we've spoken about before. Given the importance of oral transmission and the timeline for the development of the development of Christian literature. How significant is this issue likely to have been? That's a complicated question. Um, so I would say that it's, it may be not putting things quite in the right chronological order. I don't think that um, Christianity was condemned for being like lower class, uneducated, people who don't know any children, you know, women who never been to school. That, that charge didn't come about after pagans started realizing that the New Testament was in uh, 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 a less adequate form of Greek. What happened is Christianity first was attractive to lower classes. Um, uh, Jesus himself was uh, a manual laborer uh, and probably had a farm plot of some kind of peasant uh, in a rural area. His followers were peasants. Their, their followers were peasants. And Christianity early on, Paul himself says that not many people are rich or educated. Uh, and so that's before the New Testament was written. Uh, after the New Testament got written, people started pointing out, yeah, it's not great literature. But they don't start pointing that out until the end of the second century or so, 
when pagans start recognizing that um, that Christians have these books that they say are from God, and pagans start saying, "You say these books are from God? God doesn't write very well." <laughs> and so, uh, and so that did become an issue. But it's not why I think that the social level of Christians was considered to be rather low by comparison. Um, I think the two go together because you didn't have high level. Uh, educated elite, by and large, producing Christian literature until later on at the end of the second century, into the third, fourth century, you start getting it. But um, so I don't think it's what led to the lower classes. I think it's, it's what is kind of a result of the lower classes being the ones that converted. Thank you. And we have one final question that is somewhat related to our topic for next week. If Jesus came back today, would he look at what is being done in his name and say, you guys nailed it? <laughs> be more likely to say you people are nailing me <laughs> I mean, this is like man you're crucifying me all over again <laughs> this is not what i was teaching uh so i i think uh we'll be talking about that with respect to very conservative protestant christianity fundamentalism uh, in our next episode but um the kinds of things jesus was teaching i think um changed once they started changing as soon as his followers believed he got raised from the dead. Um, this is part of what my next book is going to be about, is how Jesus' ethical teachings got transformed by his followers once they came to think he was raised from the dead. It changed everything for them because his own teaching that a kingdom of God was soon to come and people needed to repent and prepare for this kingdom that was soon to arrive. They needed to be forgiven of their sins so they could enter into the kingdom. That got radically changed when they started thinking that Jesus' death is what brings us into the kingdom, not repentance. And so uh, that started the change of Jesus' teachings. And, you know, in these days, uh, you know, there aren't any, I don't know of any Christians who actually, I, who are actually, you know, doing what Jesus was telling them to do. <laughs> there may be some out there, but I've never met any. And so, um, which comes as a shock. And, you know, people think it's arrogant of me, but I'm not, I, I mean, I generally think that Jesus was teaching things that people don't do. Uh, and so I don't think he would think that people are following what he was teaching. I think he would think they're following some other religion that's, you know, that's based on what they're saying about my death and resurrection, but they're not following my, my, what I was teaching. Thank you very much, audience, as ever. Thank you all so much for your questions. But before we finish for the week, would you mind summarizing what we spoke about? Uh, yeah, so we're, we're talking about this interesting topic, of, you know, some people think a lot about and some people have never thought about. Is Jesus in Genesis? <laughs> um, something you, you were saying, Megan, was that I hadn't occurred to you, and it's something that I used to think about when I was a conservative, uh, evangelical, fundamentalist Christian, uh, because... Uh, for us, the Bible is a coherent un unit. Uh, God wrote the entire thing, and Jesus is the point. And so you can find Jesus in Genesis. From the creation story, through the Garden of Eden, through the flood, through Joseph being sold into slavery, it's all it's really all about Jesus. And so many Christian interpreters still will say, if you just look up on the internet, look up, is Jesus in Genesis? Yeah, I'm sure you'll find, I haven't done it, but I'm sure you'll find lots of, lots of people talking about, okay, there you go. And so, um, and I was just talking about how, you know, historically that's not true. The, whoever wrote the, the books of Genesis, the book of Genesis, like the rest of the Pentateuch was put together from a number of sources who were not thinking about Jesus. So you, if you're reading it historically, the answer is no. There are ways, though, if you're a Christian, you can read Genesis in ways that can inform your Christian faith. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, but it's not historically trying to put Jesus back there. Audience, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast and make sure you don't miss future episodes. Remember that you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.bartehrman.com. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. Bart, what are we talking about next time? Well, yeah, it relates to this last question. The, the issue we'll be dealing with is do, do fundamentalist Christians actually follow Jesus or not? Uh, you'll get my, my opinion on it. I have one. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Join us then. Thank you all and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday. 
So please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.